see you here tonight. I uh, thought about uh, trying to preach a Thanksgiving sermon, but I discovered I had so much to be thankful for I never could finish it. <laughs> so I decided I better stay with something I might can finish before midnight. It is so good to see you tonight. And I tell you, the family of God is going to, is awfully good down here, but it's, it, uh, it will be something else when we get to glory, where we dropped all of the infirmities of the flesh. It's going to be awfully good, isn't it? I mean, if you can enjoy yourself like this in this old body, uh, it's going to be wonderful when we get without it. Yes, sir. I trust that the Lord will speak to you tonight. I uh, believe that what I have to say tonight is probably what I would tell a young man if he'd come to me and just simply say, uh, what's the most important thing you can say to me that will be so basic that I will use it every day of my life and the rest of my life? I just, what's the most basic issue that you can say? You know, the thing that will make the most difference to me in my life. I believe I would share with that person what I'm going to share with you tonight. Now, I want to start out with a passage out of the 19th chapter of the book of John. I have probably been preaching this uh, message for about 20 years, but I, I don't know that I have uh, ever preached what I'll say tonight in, in detail, but some places you'll recognize that uh, you've been around me much, that you've been there before, and then some places you'll realize that the Lord is just keep has kept enlarging and enlarging on what he's been saying. In fact, I just had a real battle about preaching this message because I, I feel that it's so basic that uh, I've had a battle about it because when I was down here just visiting a few weeks ago, I uh, brought this message, but uh, the Lord just kept impressing me that I needed to bring it tonight. And I discovered, the best I remember, it wasn't to a night crowd, and about 90% of this crowd didn't hear it. And so uh, uh, the Lord uh, has just really uh, continued to impress me. Uh, so I'm going to head out in this direction. I, I'm really shocked in our day. I am extremely shocked in our day that the uh, people that I know are falling away to different issues that are so subjective and <clears throat> they're literally forsaking the Lord for something that's more tangible and it takes less than faith to experience what they're experiencing. And anything you experience that takes less than faith, beloved, it's not of God. That's right. Now, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So, um, it really has, it's bothered me that's what's happening today. Because I, I see some, so many people, just so many people just falling along the wayside. And I feel there's many reasons for it. And one of the reasons that I feel we're falling along the wayside is that we have lost our understanding of what is expected of us. And we no longer have a standard by which to look to. For a long time we have uh, had the tendency to find men that we think's getting the job done, and we have followed those men, but they've disappointed us. 
And on the other side, we have had a tendency to find a formula that if we could just execute this formula, we could get the job done. But that has, you know, disappointed us. And so we have failed to find that standard of living that really, really identifies us and allows us to see something that we're supposed to be and do. And with it, when you have that type of confusion in your life, beloved, if, for instance, if there's no standard, if there's no standard by which to judge yourself, you judge yourself by yourself and you end up in confusion. And so tonight, what I, I want to do is, is hold up that standard that I, I believe that God could really use in our lives. And in the 19th chapter of the book of John, the 28th verse, after this Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. And there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it up on hyssop and put it to his mouth. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. What I want you to see here is the last few seconds of Jesus Christ as the Son of Man, fulfilling all the Scripture that had been written about him. There were... There are many, many things that were written about Jesus. And Jesus Christ now, definitely the Son of God, but not as the Son of God, but as the Son of Man, has literally fulfilled everything that is written about him. So when he cried out, it is finished, it could now be said of him what was written of him. Now, what I'm saying that is victory. What I'm trying to do is to define for us what is victory. What is real victory? Because there's so many people saying, hey, I have had this experience. And uh, another one will say, hey, I have got the victory. That's right. And another one saying, hey, I'm doing the will of God. And what they're doing is defining their victory by the level of their understanding, and they're coming up way short of what the Word of God teaches. One of the operators of one of the most outstanding religious programming and religious uh, television organizations in America is, my dear friends, the chairman of that board is Holly Coors that owns Coors Beer. And many of you are watching that man and lapping it up and living it up yeah. and identifying yourselves with what he teaches. Yes, and my dear friends, there he is, letting a, man, a woman that owns a brewery company be the chairman of his board. Now that's something, because you know that fellow will tell you what is victory. Yeah. That man will define to you what is victory. And... Uh, I would probably define it differently. And what I'm trying to say to you is this. Jesus Christ defined for us what is victory. When he came into the world, now he was the son of God, and I don't think you doubt that, but he was also the son of man, and as the son of man, Jesus Christ lived up to everything that was written about him in this book what was written about him in this book. So when he said it's finished, it could be said of him what was written of him. Now that is victory. You see, there's a lot of things that are written about you and me in this book. There's a lot of things that are written about us. That's right. Now victory is having it said of you what's written of you. Not your opinion or my opinion. But my dear friends, having it said of you, what is written of you right here in this book? That is victory. That is victory. Young people, listen. 
I don't care what they say about you. If it's not said of you what is written of you in this book, you do not have the victory. That's right. That is so important. I used to hear a man say something that influenced me a great deal. His name was Dr. James Alexander Stewart. His daughter is here tonight. As her husband and some of the grandchildren of Dr. Stewart. He used to make this statement. I, the first time I heard it, I tell you, it blew me away. He said, you never have a testimony that you are a Christian unless you have victory in your life. He said, the world only knows that you're saved when you have victory in your life even though you might be saved. He said, the world only knows that when you're saved, when you have victory in your life. Now, what I'm saying tonight, that victory is having it said of you in your life what is written in this book. That's not what people think about you. Hey, by the way, it's not even how you feel. I I get so disturbed that people said, hey, I got peace in my heart. Let me tell you something. If that peace contradicts this book, your peace is not God. That's right, if it contradicts this book. So having it said of you, what is written of you in this book, my dear friends, is the issue. That's victory to me. That is genuine victory. Now, I'm not going to say all there is about that's what's written about us in this book, but I do want to just mention a couple of things. One of the things that's written about us in this book is that we're a saint. The Bible says that we're saints. You didn't, uh, you'll not be dead a 400 years and someone looks back upon your works and then name you a saint. The moment you got saved by the grace of God, washed in the blood of the Lamb, you became a saint. And all of you boys and girls here tonight, you, by, the Bible says you're a saint. But the issue tonight is this. Is it said of you what is written of you in your schoolhouse? Not up here at church. Anyone can come to the church for three to five hours a week and people call you a saint. You can be full of the devil and act like a Christian that long. Amen. You can fool everybody, my dear friends, that long. For three or five hours a week, you can know what... Very few people ever come to church more than five hours a week. But my dear friends, you can fool anyone that long. That's not the issue. The issue, my dear friends, is in the home, on the job, in the school, wherever you are, in your social event, do the people about you say, I want you to know that person lives like, acts like, walks like, smells like, talks like a saint. That is the issue. That's the genuine issue. Is it being said of you what is written of you? Is it being said of you what is written of you? I had a definition that I like that describes a saint better than anything I've ever heard. This kid had gone to Europe and as a child he'd seen those beautiful cathedrals over there and they have these huge windows in those beautiful cathedrals. And if you've ever seen them, many of them says St. Luke, St. Paul, St. John. And this kid had seen those beautiful cathedrals with those beautiful windows. And his teacher asked him one day, asked the whole class to stand up one by one and describe a saint. Define a saint. And this little old boy stood up after a while and having seen all of those windows, St. Paul, St. Luke, St. Mark, St. John. And he said, I believe a saint is someone that lets the light shine through. Now, folk, is it being said of you what is written of you? I don't care what you do here. Very likely you're not going to act like the devil very much. But I'm going to tell you something. You're not preaching many sermons here. That's too many of you. But you are preaching a sermon in your home. And you are preaching a sermon in school and on the job. And every day you are preaching a sermon. And very likely, 
The measure of your Christianity is determined by how you act when you're the worst shape. Not when you're at the best shape. That does not tell necessarily the real you. The real person, my dear friends, comes through when everything is down and everything is against you. That's right. How do you act then? Is it being said of you what is written of you? She or he is a saint. Yes, sir. Other people say, well, I'll tell you, I don't want anything to do with that person because they profess to know the Lord, but do not live like one. Now, there's some other things that, are written, that is written about us. Another one is, the Bible says that we're a priest, and I love this. And I may have heard this this week. I don't know. I, I, maybe I did. I, if, you, if I heard it, most of you heard it. But for a long time, I've always felt that a priest, and this is so simplistic, you, we may miss it. It's not profound enough. It's not mystical enough. You know the day, we're just like the Jews when uh, Jesus came. If Jesus Christ had walked in out of the sky, they would have accepted him. If he had walked in out of the sky as a grown man. But in that he was supernatural, they naturally born, they couldn't handle it. And my dear friends, we're running around today looking for some supernatural manifestation that God Almighty can walk through a place and we not even know it. Yes, sir. And this may be a little too simplistic, but let me tell you, the Bible teaches that a priest is a go-between. And a priest means that someone that knows how to reach hold of God who has the supply and man who has the need and my dear friends, bring that supply and that need together. And I want you to know something. We have such a casual way saying, hey, pray for me. That's just a byword with us today. But let me tell you, I don't know of anything in this world that could be more significant and there's a greater compliment in all the world than someone saying, listen, please pray for me. Because it shouldn't mean, my dear friends, that you know how to reach up and get hold of God that has the supply and reach hold and get hold of the need with the other hand and bring those two together. That should be the case. I don't know of anything more significant than having it said, my dear friends, you know how to get hold of God and man and bring them together. Yes, sir. Is it said of you that you're a priest? That's right. I, I tell you, it really, it, it does something to me to be waking up at four or five in the morning or the middle of the night and have somebody to say, Brother Manley, please pray for me. You know why? Because my dear friends, they, they understand and they feel in their heart and they think in their mind that I know how to get hold of God with one hand and my dear friends, with their knee with the other and bring those two together. Father, what a compliment. Is it being said of you what is written of you? Is it being said of you what's written of you? Then there's another issue, and that is this. The Bible says that we're kings. Now king rules and reigns. And that's so interesting to me because I'm one of the kings. And if you've been saved by the grace of God, you are too. And my, if you're one of the kings, that means that you have a dominion by which you rule and you reign. And the Bible says when the wicked rule, people mourn. But when the righteous rule, people rejoice. And my dear friends, when we are actually living out what's been written of us, we as individuals, kings in Christ, are ruling and reigning in the dominion that God has allotted us by his sovereign grace. And my dear friends, we're in control of that home, and we're in control of that situation. And the area that we control, my dear friend, even though the devil fights, when the righteous rule, people rejoice. And when the wicked rule, people mourn. My dear friends, it's something. When a saint, a priest, and a king is ruling and reigning. My friends, I've traveled over this country 
I have traveled over America for 30 years as an evangelist. And I've traveled over the world as a person since 1945, all over this world. And do you know I can take you to places in this world when you drive in the community, you can sense the presence and the power of the glory of Almighty God. And you can go into other areas and you can fell the demons of hell, the oppression and the depression and the structure of hell. My dear friend, you can literally tell it. And you know what you find? When you find that the righteous are in rule, you'll find some dear old saints of God somewhere, somehow. Some of them don't even have any teeth in their head. Yeah. My dear friends, some of them so poor, you'd be embarrassed to have a meal with them. And my friends, some of them are so far back in the mountains that they haven't even seen a big city. But I want you to know, friend, they are ruling and reigning and kings. And I want you to know the only reason tonight America is still together is because of some of those blessed old saints of God. They're ruling and reigning. Yes, sir. You, all, you know, these Baptists today, they want to live like kings. But bless God, they don't want to live. They, they don't want to take the responsibility of a king and pay the price. There's a price, brother, to pay, to live and be one. But the tragedy of it is, is it said of you what's written of you? The heartache is, my dear friends, we can't even rule and reign over our own homes. Yeah. Our children are without God. Yeah. They're without God because, my friend, we're not even ruling reigning in our own homes yeah. as kings and priests and saints. Now, Jesus accomplished this. You said, well, he's the Son of God. He did not accomplish this victory as the Son of God. He accomplished this victory as the Son of Man. That's why I can preach this to you and be applicable on my level and your level. As the Son of Man, Jesus Christ accomplished this victory. And so it really interests me as to how he did it. And that really interests me. Because, my dear friends, I do not believe he, he did anything that he did, does not expect us to do. And we get to that issue. The first thing I want to say about Jesus as to how he accomplished this victory is this, Jesus Christ never, never, never went out on his own in this sense. Jesus Christ lived a life of submission. He said, my meat is to do the will of the Father. That's what he said. In other words, my dear friends, he was yielded to the Father in such a way that he did not do anything that wasn't the will of the Father. And he got strength and life and power in the life of the Father. And I want to tell you tonight, a lot of the reasons for these heart attacks and nervous breakdowns and physical breakdowns and disaster is the Christian out there trying to do his best for God and he's totally missing God into things he's not even supposed to be in. Amen. Jesus. You see, when he did the will of the Father, he got strength. He didn't lose it. Yes, sir. He got it. Now think about it. Now think about it. You know, you and I get washed out. <laughs> he didn't. Now he took aside some time to talk. We used to say come aside before you come apart or something like that. But my dear friends, let me tell you something. All of his little times aside with God the Father... I want you to know weren't rest periods. Jesus Christ lived a life of submission. Now I'm going to bring it home just a little closer. Jesus said, not only 
My meat is to do the will of the Father. But listen to me now. I'm going to tell you something. If you don't get this, I'll guarantee you, you'll miss God if you don't get it. Jesus Christ said, I do nothing except what I see the Father do. Now that brings that submission home just a little closer. He said, I do nothing except what I see the Father do. What am I saying? Jesus Christ, who had all wisdom, could understand it all. My dear friends, Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, said, I do not nothing except what I see the Father do. Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, never initiated not one of his involvements. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Son of Man, always allowed God the Father to initiate his involvement. Do you know the difference tonight between Christianity and religion? Is who has initiated what you're involved in. Yes, sir. My dear friends, let me tell you something. If you have misunderstood inspiration for revelation, or you have misunderstood information for revelation, and you have taken out on projects that Jesus Christ did not initiate, I want you to know it's nothing but religious. I don't care how good it is. Brother Abraham was at his best religiously when Hagar and the Ishmaelite was born. He was not at his worst. He was trying to preserve and fulfill the Word of God. And he was at his best, not at his worst. But the Lord did not initiate that. That's religion, but not Christianity. He said, Brother Manley, I'm doing it because I love God. Well, obviously, then, if God didn't initiate it, you're doing it for God. Amen. You're not doing it with Him. And see, when you initiate or allow inspiration, and by the way, we do need inspiration. Hey, by the way, we need information. But when you substitute inspiration and information for revelation, and what I'm using the word revelation as here as the point of God initiating things in our life. And when you use it as that, my dear friends, you're out there on your own and the Lord Jesus is not with you. I don't care how religious it is. Now, folk, if you miss this point, then you miss the whole issue of walking with Jesus. Now I'm glad he has mercy and grace. But I'm going to tell you that even runs out. You mean grace and mercy runs out? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you get so far out, my dear friends, the mercy and grace stops because it becomes mercy and grace to shut you down. Amen. Amen. You say, what are you talking about, preacher? That bunch that walked out of Egypt, headed to Canaan. It came, finally came to grace, just shut that bunch down. You get out there, my dear friends, on your own, not Jesus having not initiated what you do. Oh, my dear friends, he's not with you. And if you've got to pump it up, and if you've got to keep it up, and you've got to work it up, and you've got to maintain it, I got news for you. You got a job. Yeah. <laughs> you see, Jesus Christ never initiated his own involvement. God the Father always did that. Amen. Amen. I'm going to tell you something, folks. Anything he initiates, 
if you maintain your right walk with him, he stays with. And anything he stays with, he finishes. And if he didn't start it, he flat. He's not with it. And he's not finishing it. Yes, sir. You know, the darkest hour in my life, the one thing that made the difference, folk, was not how many experiences I'd had with God. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. It wasn't even my history. I'd been preaching since I was 18 years old. And I'm telling you about a super... I mean, God had supernaturally blessed me all those years. But, folk, I want to tell you something. That did not, did not solve the problem. But I was living in Mississippi. And I'd gone out to Coolidge, Texas for a meeting. And the last night of that meeting, a little old boy had come in from Baylor, sat down on the second pew, and when I preached, he got so upset that he started beating his head against the pew in front of him, and the blood just started gushing. And I tell you, it was one of those cases where, you know, you were pushed into a situation where you had no other alternative. And so I just had to deal with the boy, and I had never dealt with a boy, a person like that, and the preacher never dealt with a person like that, and the singer never dealt with a person like that. And I told that bunch, if you weren't right with God, you'd better get out of that church out. I didn't have any better sense than tell them. And they flat took out of that church house and left us a few of us there. I talked to that little boy about Jesus and, and rebuked the devil the best I understood, and that boy got saved. And 30 minutes after he got saved, I began to run chills and fever. And I mean, it was an awful experience. I, be, I was sick. They handed me my check that night. I'd, I'd gone out there in a car that got over 22 miles to a gallon of gas. And they handed me a check for my love offering and expenses that did not even cover the gas expenses. And I was, had two meetings cancel out. And I was headed home that night with chills and fever. And my dear friends, the devil whispered in my ear. And he said, why don't you quit this business? This is a bunch of foolishness. This bunch, they do not care whether you go to hell or heaven. They do not care whether you eat or starve, whatever. They don't care about you. They don't care about you. And all the way across that part of Texas into the state of the Louisiana, the devil said, why don't you quit? Listen, my friends, I've been on a bed when the doctors were saying, and they didn't know I was conscious, that he'll not make it. One year ago, last October, they said I wouldn't make it. And those were dark hours, but let me tell you something, friend. That was not the darkest hour of my life. The darkest hour of my life was that night coming across that state of Texas and Louisiana with a devil whispering in my ear, Why don't you quit? You can quit and get rich and quit and let this bunch go to hell. They don't care about you. And the devil said everything to me I believe he could think of that night driving across that country. And my friend, just about the time I hit West Monroe, began to start into West Monroe, Louisiana, about daylight, the sun began to rise. And I was so low, I was ready to throw it in. And I never will forget, I'd offered every argument that I knew to stand that test that night. It was the most severe test I've ever had in my life. And finally it hit me. I said, God, I didn't start this business. Bless God, you started it. Yes, you started it. Yes, sorry. Brother, when I said you started it, God, I didn't. Heaven opened up, and the Son of God took on a new dimension in my life, and the devil had to be defeated, and he was gone. Yes, sir, brother. Now, I have to tell you the rest of it just to show you how this thing was planned. I drove on into West Monroe, and I looked across the street, and there was a man sweeping off his place of business that I knew, and I didn't even know he had a business. And he saw me, and I, by the time I saw him, he recognized me, and he waved me in. And I drove in, and we had a cup of coffee, and here I am having chills and fever. Chills and fever, like a million needles in my body. He said, you know, Brother Manley, I'm in the chicken business. And he said, before you go, I want to load you down with chickens. He got those several crates of chickens put in that old car and loaded me down with those chickens, ice down. 
Well, I, I mean, that's just a few miles into town. I drove across that town to regular Monroe, east side. There's some friends owned a furniture store. It was early in the morning. They just got there. They put me to bed. Didn't say a word to me. And put me to bed. And I slept for a couple hours. And got up and came downstairs. Now watch this, folk. Watch it. I came downstairs ready to go. And they said, Brother Manley, we want to show you something. Said, we got a letter in here last week from Tom Hudson. This building is dedicated to him. And that man I had not seen in months and months and months wrote this man. I didn't even know he knew him. Name was Johnny Adams. And he said, Mr. Adams, somehow I feel that you will see Brother Manley Beasley before I do. And God told me to send this check to you. Oh, brother. I'll tell you, friend. Oh, my soul. What a glory. And I got home, and I had to go to bed. I had to go to bed, and old Zeke Lancaster. Oh, Zeke. Oh, my stars, what a preacher. And I'll tell you, he'd preach the hell out of everything, and then turn around and preach, preach some more out of them. I never, I'll tell you, he's something. But he's a sweet old boy. And I'll tell you, I'd gone to school with him. Billy had gone to school with him. Ed had gone to school with him. Harold had gone to school with him back in the dark ages. And, uh, and so I'll, I'll tell you, old Zeke came to my house and he said, Brother Manley, you remember that, that countywide meeting we had a few months ago out in Arkansas? And I said, yes, sir. He said, Brother Manley, he said, uh, you know, we gave you a good love offering. I, I agreed. He said, you know, we had a meeting the other day of all the committee and we paid all of our bills and we had $2,000 left over and said we voted to bring you that $2,000. No. Yes, sir, brother, I'll tell you, God had that thing so set up, it was unreal. But a missionary had to be sitting by to pray for me before I could get well. That's right. And the very next week, I came to Broussard Grove Baptist Church down here south of town. I never will forget it, but my life was changed. You know what? You know what defeated the devil that day? You know what, my dear friends, stabilized me in that crucial hour? You know what, my dear friends, enabled me to go on and enter into the blessings of the Lord was the one fact that I did not call myself to preach. I didn't have anything to do with it. God initiated. God started it. He moved, and I just simply obeyed. Yes, sir, folks. And if you don't get that part, I'll guarantee you, your life will be full of religion, but not Christianity. Because Jesus only stands by what he initiates. Yes, sir. Brother, if you don't learn how to settle that issue, I got news for you. Yes, you're done for. You kids that haven't got husbands and wives yet. I want you to know something. A lot of beautiful people and there's a lot of pretty girls and good-looking boys. But I want you to know something. You better stay with God till God says, that's the one. But I don't care who you are. I don't care who you are. You don't know enough. And you haven't got enough on the ball to keep a home together and rear children. You just flat haven't got to do it. You don't have it. And I'll tell you, you'll go under if you do not know Jesus has initiated it. But if you know he's initiated it, you can come back to him and say, okay, God, you started it. Now straighten her out. You started it. Straighten him out. Oh, you started it. You can laugh if you want to, bless God, but I'll tell you one thing. He says you get renewed. You get transformed by the renewing of your mind, reminding God he started it. If you don't think that's the case, you just look at old brother Moses at the Red Sea. He stood up and preached one of the greatest sermons on faith that's ever been preached. He said, stand still with that bunch of Egyptians behind him and the Red Sea in front of him. Brother, if that's not faith, let me put you out there in the street and you see a Mack truck coming down one way and one coming down the other way and say, hey, brother, stand still. You're talking about a sermon, brother. He had it. See the salvation of the Lord. 
stand still. <laughs> I'll tell you one thing. He preached that sermon, and then when he got through with that sermon, he said, oh, God, I'm in trouble. He got shook. Some man said he was over behind a rock. I don't know if he's behind a rock or not, but I'll tell you one thing. He was in trouble. And you know what God did? God said, hey, why callest thou on me? And I, I'll be honest with you. You know what I believe God reminded him of? The fact that God started that thing. I believe he started it. And anything he starts, he commits himself to. And I think when God gave him a little glimpse of that, he was ready for the commandment. The Lord said, take that rod and head out. Amen. Folk, let me tell you something tonight. After all of these years, after all of these years, the thing, the people that I see that miss God are the people that walk on with God. The difference is they've learned how God initiates things. Amen.